Our view of what is natural, or meant to be, changes over time. The original meaning of nature was that of birth. The second meaning is more general and described as that which is within. And then the meaning that Aristotle used was that nature describes the essence of a thing. Natural law, therefore, is about what life should be like. Natural law encompasses a tradition of moral and legal philosophy that dates back all the way to Aristotle. Natural law can be most simply understood as a body of universal and changing moral principles that present the basis for all human conduct. The assumption is that obedience to natural law is the basis for a peaceful and just society. Natural law theory assumes that human beings possess intrinsic values that govern our reasoning and behaviour. The theory maintains that the rules of right and wrong, good and evil, are encoded intrinsically in human reasoning. The concept of natural law has been the subject of inquiry of many philosophers who vary slightly in their interpretation. This presentation will explain how the meaning of this concept has changed over time and has survived to remain relevant through the notable intellectual periods, namely Aristotle in 350 BC in the Classical period, St. Thomas Aquinas in the year 1200 in the Middle Ages, and finally Thomas Hobbes and John Locke from the Enlightenment period of the 17th century. As we know, Aristotle believed in an unchanging order to a changing physical world. Aristotle's four causes help us understand the nature of things. If a person plants a seed in soil, waters it, and exposes it to sunlight, the seed will grow into a plant. Aristotle would say that this is because the nature of the seed is to grow in specific conditions. Aristotle's idea of the good is that which fulfills the purpose for which it was created. Similarly, Aristotle believed that the nature of human beings is reason, or that the ability to reflect through thought on behaviour and surroundings is what makes us human and distinct from animals. As a nominalist, Aristotle believed that there is a natural justice that is valid everywhere with the same force and does not simply exist in the minds of people. In his time, Aristotle made the distinction between that which is just by nature and that which is just by law, enabling us to examine morality as an internal human function that is far beyond man-made common statutes. For Thomas Aquinas, natural law and religion were inextricably connected. In his approach to ethics, Aquinas combined Aristotle's understanding with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Aquinas believed that the natural law was the moral code that humans were naturally inclined towards. He believed that the natural law participates in the divine or eternal law, and that God's commandments reveal ideal human nature and the reasoning for moral life. Aquinas thought eternal law to be the rational plan by which all creation is ordered, and natural law is the way that human beings participate correctly in the eternal law by doing good and avoiding evil. Based on Aristotle's four causes, Aquinas believed that there are four purposes for which humans were created. To live peacefully in society, to reproduce, to learn, and to worship God. He believed that any action that functions as a mean to these ends or the efficient causes are considered good. Aquinas argued that if it is natural for human beings to live in society, then it follows that society must be regulated, for a group of humans cannot endure if each individual seeks his own unique ends. He argued that humans should be ruled for the common interest or common good, to prevent chaos and foster knowledge, culture and virtue. Aquinas believed that the social order is derived from God, and that those with superior intellect would, would, by natural reason and divine law, become the rulers. Aquinas believed that a ruler should keep the laws he makes for others. Aquinas said, Law is nothing else than an ordination of reason for the common good promulgated by the one who is in charge of the community. With this, Aquinas Aquinas discussed the dynamic between eternal law, natural law, human law, and divine law. Early economists of the medieval period, including Aquinas, heavily emphasized natural law as an aspect of economics in their theories of just prices and economic goods. The Enlightenment included a range of ideas centered on sovereignty of reason and the evidence of the senses as primary sources for knowledge. The ideas of the Enlightenment undermined the authority of the monarchy and the Catholic Church and paved the way for the political or economic revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. The concept of natural laws was used to challenge the divine right of kings 
and became an alternative justification for the establishment of a social contract, positive law, and government. Conversely, the concept of natural rights is used by others to challenge the legitimacy of all such institutions. Philosophers of natural law often do not explicitly concern themselves with economic matters. Likewise, economists systematically refrain from making explicit moral value judgments. Yet the fact that economics and natural law are intertwined has been borne out consistently in the history of economic thought. Natural law as an ethical theory can be understood as an extension of scientific and rational inquiry into how the world works. This means that the laws of economics can be understood as natural laws of how the economy should operate. More, to the extent that economic analysis is used to prescribe public policy or how people ought to conduct themselves in transactions, the practice of applied economics must rely at least implicitly on some sort of ethical assumption. From natural law to natural rights through understanding the state of nature. We will now go to Hobbes. In his life, Hobbes witnessed the violent bloodshed of Cromwell and the English Civil War. This informed his conclusions that human nature puts survival above all else. Hobbes believed that human nature is self-interested, competitive, violent, control-seeking, distrustful and quarrelsome, and therefore to live in peace, people must give up their power. For Hobbes, the purpose of government is to preserve life, prevent violence, develop industry and culture, and secure against foreign invasion. Hobbes believed that a peaceful society could not exist without the power of the state. He said that in the state of nature there is no society, and that every person lives in continual fear and danger of violence and death. The life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes believed that private property could exist only by the will of the state, because in a state of nature, men are condemned to endless violent conflict. Hobbes rejected the theories before him and believed that men do not know good from evil and can only live in peace together under subjugation to the absolute power of a common master. Hobbes believed that obedience to positive laws afford a person the right to not be killed by the state and that citizens have no right to rebel. Hobbes believed that men give up natural rights in return for being kept alive and that the state gets to determine what defines justice and that society is simply a creation of the state. To Hobbes, even the cruelest despotism is better than the fear and danger of the state of nature. This should be justification enough for a social contract. In contrast to Hobbes, Locke believed that man is a social animal with a conscience that causes him not to want to harm other people, but since some will violate it, the government must enforce it. Locke believed that in the state of nature, men often kept their promises and honoured their obligations, and that people are likely to cooperate and are not necessarily self-interested. Although this was not true, always, life was good and pleasant. Locke believed that it is socially acceptable to punish the wrongdoings done against you, and that humans do know right from wrong and are capable of knowing what is lawful and unlawful so to resolve conflicts. Locke believed that conflict should be avoided by respecting the property and persons of others. As the father of the social contract, Locke believed that we give up our right to exact redistribution for crimes committed against us in return for impartial justice backed by force. In contrast to Hobbes, Locke believed that society precedes the state morally and historically and is what gives the state legitimacy. Locke believed in natural rights that the nature of men is to have certain rights that we are born with, endowed by God simply because we are human, and these cannot be taken away. These include the right to life free from threats of violence, the right to liberty, free to make our own decisions within the harm principle, and the right to property, free to keep and sell the fruit of our labor. Locke said that humans were obliged no liberty to destroy oneself and no authority to destroy another or harm their life, liberty, or property. Locke valued the concept of private property as an essential means to self-preservation. He said each person should be free to pursue their own ends, and that the individual is sovereign and cannot be ruled over without permission. Society is a collection of individuals for Locke, and the role of the state is to enforce the above rights. He said people willingly part with the absolute liberty from the state of nature in order to escape a life of fear. This is the basis of social contract theory, that people give up individual freedom in exchange for peace and protection. This is how a legitimate government is formed. 
Locke based his theories related to economics on a version of natural law, arguing that people have a natural right to claim unowned resources and land is private property, thereby transforming them into economic goods by mixing them with their labor. References to the economy are ubiquitous in modern life, and virtually every facet of human activity has capitulated to market mechanisms. In the early modern period, however, there was no common perception of the economy, and discourses on money, trade, and commerce treated economic phenomena as properties of physical nature. According to Margaret Chabas in The Natural Origins of Economics, only in the early 19th century did economists begin to posit and identify the economy as a distinct object, divorcing it from natural processes and attaching it exclusively to human laws and agency. Shabas locates the evolution of economic ideas within the history of natural science and includes concepts introduced by economists, politicians, and philosophers. Even Adam Smith makes use of the nature framework in his thesis. In the theory of moral sentiments, he describes a system of natural liberty as being the matrix of true wealth. Smith's ideas are set out in his three natural laws of economics. The law of self-interest, that people work for their own good, the law of competition, that competition forces people to make better products, and the law of supply and demand, that enough goods will be produced at the lowest possible price to meet demand of a market economy. It's fair to say that the contributions made by philosophers in this presentation significantly impacted the economic ideas that came after them, from David Hume, Jeremy Bentham, John Baptiste Say, Thomas Maltus, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Wilfred Pareto, and John Maynard Keynes, as well as Hayek, Strauss, and many more. Thank you for listening.